Principle number eight, it is not possible to fight a fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. Number one, many times we will lose students because they believe the lie, fill in the blank. They will believe the lie of the devil that the world has something to offer in their recovery. You know, we, we talked about it a little bit in group, but we know people who um, their answer to their problems is a worldly psychiatrist who, who prescribes a worldly prescription. Um, and that's just putting a Band-Aid on the problems. Most problems are spiritual. We, as Christians, we understand that all problems are spiritual. People think, why isn't there a problem in peace in the Middle East? I don't mean to, to blow anybody's, you know, pop anybody's bubble here, but there will never be peace in the Middle East. There, there will be someday when Jesus returns. Why? Because it's a spiritual battle there. It's not about bound. Technically, it's, it's about boundaries and war. It's Israel. It's that they hate Israel spiritually they hate our god they hate the christian god and little little israel is surrounded by them and that battle has been going on since you know since since the days of esau ishmael. and jacob and ishmael i mean there, there's been trouble in the middle east since the beginning since the beginning and we know how long that's been so the problem is is that the world tells the world teaches that you you can solve your problems with worldly with there's worldly answers the problem is it's like someone who's sick you can, yeah, you can maybe uh, put something on on it to make it feel better, but you're not getting to the root cause of the problem. And the root cause is always spiritual. It may manifest itself as, if you have a drinking problem or you have a drug problem or you have a pornography problem, they're spiritual problems. They may manifest themselves in a physical, worldly problem, but everything is a spiritual problem. If you have an anger issue, it's spiritual. Like we talked about it tonight, you're not under attack by the devil, you know, the one thing you got to get out of your mind is the devil may be doing There's one Satan who's not, who, who he can only be one place on this planet at a time. He's probably not messing with you. I don't mean that to be mean to anybody or anything like that. But if he can, he's probably hanging out at the White House. He's hanging out over in Israel. He's hanging out in Egypt. He's, he used to hang out with Alexander the Great and with Nero and with Hitler where he could do some major damage, right? Maybe he's messing with someone in a, at, at the head of a ministry right now trying to tempt him. Right in Hollywood, but he's not messing with us. Now, demonic activities are different, but one of the things to remember is some things happen. We're going to talk about it a little bit tonight. Is just it's your mind. It, the devil didn't make us do everything. The demons aren't making. Sometimes we we do it. We messed up. Our flesh made us do it. Really, too, truthfully, our biggest our biggest enemy is the flesh. It, it, it's not Satan and demonic and demons. While they're out there and they're they're a force to be reckoned with. Our biggest problem is in our mind. Mm -hmm. You know that all oh, that there's books out there called the battlefield of the mind. Our biggest enemy is our is right here. You you let you let your mind you if you were to record your self talk during the day, you talk to yourself. You would never let other people talk to you that way. The way you talk to yourself, the things that you call yourself, the things that you say to yourself, the things that you say about yourself. You would never let anybody else say that to you. But it's okay if you do it in your mind. So that's why when we talk about casting down imaginations and holding every thought obedience to Christ, it's just that we've got to retrain our mind to focus on how God sees us, what the Bible says, and not what our, our flesh thinks. Number two, the battle is inside of us and is spiritual. It's really a spiritual battle. And it's a spiritual battle. Why? Because the battle is with what? We talked about it in class a couple of weeks ago with Simon and Peter. That two natures is the battle that's in our lives. 90% of our battles in our lives are between the two natures that war against in our minds. If the Apostle Paul dealt with it, we're sure going to deal with it. The two natures exist in everyone. It is always, every day that we live, it's a battle of the spiritual flesh. And some days, let's face it, the flesh wins. There are days when at the end of the day, the flesh can be announced the winner. And you know what? By the grace of God, tomorrow's a new day. But there are simply days when the flesh wins out. And we think flesh, we, that word fleshly, sometimes you got to replace it with worldly. When we think fleshly, it just means that we're thinking in our, when I think I've got to do something in my own strength, that's fleshly thinking. It's really a bad term, that word flesh, because it makes us think of skin and make us think of maybe things that are immoral things. But really fleshly is another word for worldly. When we're thinking fleshly thoughts, we're thinking worldly thoughts. We're not thinking spiritual thoughts. Letter A, it cannot be won with fleshly or worldly weapons. Our problems as a Christian now, remember, this, this is written for Christians. 
Our answers are spiritual. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with going to a therapist or there is anything wrong with, but, but first we've got to go to God and pray. We've got, listen, God's given us doctors. God's given us Christian therapists and Christian psychiatrists. And, and God's given, you know, we're, we're, we're not Christian scientists. I mean, we, we, if I get sick, I'm going to take the medicine. Right? God created all that. It's all from God. But what we have to remember is, is, is that we can't fight us. We certainly can't fight those fleshly temptations with fleshly weapons. Second Corinthians 10, 3, 5, we talked about it before. And I think if you look at this in a different angle, we, we know this scripture. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down, down of strongholds. And we talk about what well, this is a strongholds ministry. Right? Everybody in the church should be here. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I could teach a whole lesson on that, but think about it. Casting down imaginations means taking control of your thoughts. How many times do you think something or do you create a picture in your mind that never happens? I'm the king of it. I should be like, I should be in Hollywood. The movies I create in my mind of what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes, I could win an Academy Award on. It's, it's amazing. And I have to say to myself, you're, I have to say, stop it. Stop it. Oh my God, my boss, he didn't respond that text. He's mad at me. He's talking about me in the office right now. They're, they're probably going to get it written up any minute. Okay. I can go on for like a 15, 20 minute thing. And the next thing my boss walks by, hey, Tony, how's it going? Great. Uh, Christ is averted. My mind created a whole movie as what, what was going on. That's an imagination. That's an imagination. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, it's saying casting down any thought that's not biblical. Jesus said, don't worry about anything, right? You've heard me talk about it, especially in Sunday school. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. So when you're worrying about tomorrow, you're doing what Jesus said don't do. Yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable with you. Whenever you do something that the Bible specifically says don't do, it's going to be uneasy. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What's that mean? It means that our thoughts should line up with what? The Bible. The Bible says it. I believe it. That's it. Those are pretty simple things. But what do we do? We say, well, I know what the Bible says, but... I know what the pastor says, but we we move try to move in and out of scripture and of things that we know are right and wrong. So that's really what that second Corinthians verse in a nutshell is talking about. Number three, to avoid a habitual action or reaction to our negative thoughts, we must cast down the thought and bring our mind under subjection to the obedience of Christ. You have to realize when your thoughts are not First of all, when they're ridiculous. We can all be honest with you. Sometimes your thoughts are ridiculous. They're, I mean, if we were to cast them on a screen, you'd be like, what am I doing? How can I be thinking about that? You know, I, I was sharing in the group. It's not a private thing, but I hate going back to work after my day off because I think something's wrong. It's ridiculous. I can say up here in front of everybody, in front of the camera. It's ridiculous. It doesn't matter. I, it, I do it almost every day after my day off. I get a little bit of unease when I go to work. I think something calamitous is going to happen because I wasn't there that day. That is ridiculous. And while we can laugh and snicker, all of you, if we delved into your mind and recorded a 24-hour chip in there and played it for everybody, there's some ridiculous things that you're thinking. And when I say ridiculous, they're things that God has clearly stated in his word that we are not to do or to think of or to worry. Worry is ridiculous. God's in control and he can save us and he can take me to heaven, he surely can help me pay the rent. Mm -hmm. If I did get fired tomorrow morning, he surely can help me find the job. He got me the job in the first place. So when you think about that, you have to learn, and this is where I don't need to go to a therapist at $150 an hour to tell me this. All they do is, do you ever notice, if, even if you maybe just watch it on TV or if you're ever in a therapist, all they do is ask you questions. Why? Because you already have the answers. Being a psychiatrist is one of the greatest jobs you ever do. They just ask you questions, and you talk it out. You know why? Because you have the answer inside of you. You just need to talk it out and say, you ever, you ever have a problem that you thought was really huge, and you wrote it down on paper, you're like, oh, that ain't so bad. Because your mind takes this, 
and makes it this big. The mind is the greatest magnifier that we have on the human body. The mind takes the little thing and makes it this big. And sometimes when you calm down and you write it down, you're like, boy, that's not so big of a problem. It's certainly not a big problem to God. We think our problems are super big, but they're not. They're not too big for God. Number eight, we are not alone and we have help. Well, first of all, I'm reading a book on the Holy Spirit, and it's true. We don't give enough credit to the fact that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. I mean, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us? Because if we did, we'd realize that, boy, well, the fruit of the Spirit, right? That means that all the things are inside of me. When you, you want to know what's an imagination, I can't help but worry. I can't help my anger. It's just how I am. I can't help but worry. It's just how I am. No, that's how you are. Your mind, that other stuff, when you see the works of the flesh, that's your imagination. Because the truth is, you should see yourself the way that God sees you. First John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. We forget it's not Jesus in us, it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. It's the Holy Spirit that's in us. Sometimes, oh Lord, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. I talk to Jesus all day long, very rarely. I had to read this book and I started saying, well, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry I've been ignoring you, but you're the one that's in with me all day long. Maybe I should talk to him a little bit more. No offense towards Jesus, no offense towards God in heaven, but I talk to Jesus all the time and I'm thinking, your Holy Spirit's the one, hey, he's hanging out with me all day long. Maybe I should spend a little bit more time talking to him. Doesn't mean I ignore Jesus. But I think that I understand that it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the victory. Do you remember what Jesus, remember they're all moping and pouting and crying? And Jesus said, if I stay here, when I, I'm paraphrasing, he said, but when I leave here, I'm going to send what? The comforter. You ever notice? Study what the word yeah. comforter means. It means to comfort us. It means that when we're struggling, when we're dealing with imaginations, it's the Holy Spirit inside of us that's meant to comfort us. And finally, uh, number four, the world has nothing to offer you in your quest for recovery. We see people show up here all the time. Oh, where's the AA meeting? Where's the coffee? Oh, sorry. This isn't an AA meeting. This is a faith-based ministry. Okay. Uh, all right. Maybe we'll come back. That's because we understand that what could the world give us? Uh, prescribe a pill so you get sick when you drink maybe nothing wrong with that if you, if you just can't stop but at the end of the day you need you need jesus to, to to go into your heart you need a renewing of your mind you need to change your mind that says i i i'm a christian i don't want to live like that anymore i'm a christian Gee, god died on the cross and this is the life i'm living jesus you died for me and and this is what i did with the gift you made a home for me in heaven and, and and this is the way i'm going to live my life the fact of the matter is and this is hard for for especially addicts to understand that the world, especially when it comes to recovery, the only way to truly get recovery is you need a renewing of your mind that says, I'm going to live the life that Jesus died to give me and anything else is not acceptable. Because I've said it before, if I have to think I can never eat a donut again, I can never have fattening foods again, that will last about three days. As soon as, as long as I can keep that down. Maybe three days. So it's got. It's not at three days. Three it's a day. If there's a box of devil dogs on the on the in the cubicle next to me, <laughs> it could be a matter of minutes. But the fact of the matter is, is that if I say to myself, it's not so much keeping it down, but you know what? I need to eat healthy because I want to enjoy the life that God's given me. There's a big difference there. It's you can only suppress an appetite for so long. That's why the book is called Recovery Without Relapse. You go to an AA meeting, relapse. It's okay, brother. T totally normal. Well, why is it normal? Yeah. Why is it normal? What's normal? Is it five times, ten times, fifteen? What's the number where, it's, where it becomes not normal? You know what it is? Is is that those are fighting fleshly desires with worldly things. Talking about it. Talking about what you did. Talking about what you went through. Sitting around drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes. All not knocking those things but we're saying that is that really the answer is telling everybody about your 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 past drug use help you not use drugs in the future if i left that meeting i'd want to go do drugs mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but the reality is, is is that we have to remember the world can't offer us anything mm -hmm. and maybe you're not in recovery tonight maybe you struggle maybe like with me maybe a little bit of worry 
maybe some anxiety. Maybe there's some areas of your life. Maybe you're, you're, you could be more forgiving. Maybe there's someone in your life that you're not. The, the answers will never come to the world from the world. I know we know that, and we go to church all the time. We have the best church. We study our Bible, read our Bibles. But there are times in our life where we inevitably try to handle problems from a worldly perspective. When it's always turn to God, it's always go to prayer, it's always go to our Bible. It doesn't mean that doesn't mean that God may not direct us to a worldly solution or of the world's solution, but are we going to God first and seeking his guidance and in his word and seeking that guidance, or are we immediately turning to the world? Father, we thank you for your word.